Um, well, welcome everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Katal Tanota, and I'm the Director of the Mineral Potential of Australia section at Geoscience Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Uh, in Canberra, that's the Ngunnawal uh, people, and in the Adelaide University, where our guest speaker is from, it's the Ghana land. I also pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our seminar today. So today our guest speaker is Dr. Carl Spandler from the University of Adelaide and his talk is on unconformity related rare earth element deposits, a new source of critical metals for Australia. So Carl Spandler uh, uses uh, petrology and geochemistry to research the evolution of the Earth's crust and mantle and the formation of metalliferous ore deposits. His areas of expertise include micro analysis of trace elements and isotopes in minerals within their context in the rock formation. His current research focus is on understanding how and where ore deposits of critical metals, such as rare earth elements, are formed in, on the Australian continent. Whenever critical minerals are mentioned in the discussions in geological circles, Carl's name is uh, a very um, uh, prominent uh, uh, topic of conversation uh, as he is one of the key groups that leads um, critical minerals research and Geoscience Australia has uh, an ongoing collaboration with him through an ARC linkage. So at this point I'll hand over to Carl um, to um, uh, begin the seminar. Thanks Carl. Okay, thanks Carol. Let's, um and thanks a lot for the invitation to talk today to Geoscience Australia. Um, as Carol said, we do have ongoing collaborations uh, between University of Adelaide and, and GA in the rare earth space. And I'm gonna probably give you a little bit of a background into the work we've been doing uh, in rare earths, uh, the rare earth potential of Australia for the last seven or eight years. That um, was done largely at JCU. Uh, where I was until uh, six months ago, until uh, and, and I've recently moved to Adelaide. So a lot of the work. To, so today I'm going to start with a bit of background on uh, rare earth deposits in Australia. This is really built on work that was started by GA many years ago, uh, before critical minerals became flavour of the month. GA was really out there looking at where deposits and resources are in Australia, and my work, I guess, builds on that to try and understand how those deposits form and whether we can use that to build exploration models to find more. Um, I'm gonna talk about unconformity related rare earth deposits at the back end of the talk. And these are, I, I guess it's a new ore style that has sort of been discovered or recognized coming out of work on the Browns Range deposits in uh, Western Australia, work that um, uh, deposits that Northern Minerals have been working on and a lot of the work today that I'm going to present is actually by um, work from a PhD student, Timor Nazari de Cordy at JSU, finished a couple of years ago, but it also in involved a lot of input from Nick Oliver and on the fluid inclusion side, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit at the end from Jan Martin Heisinger at, at JSU. Um, so I guess the significance, I guess, for this new ore style, I think, is quite large. It's um, a completely different geological setting for getting rare earth mineralization, and I think it opens up a lot of Australia um, to be to be looked at in, with new eyes in terms of looking for rare earth potential, which I'll get on, get onto towards the end of the talk. All right. So first, just to clarify, rare earths. Most people will be very familiar with uh, rare earths. If you ask a geochemist, um, their definition of what rare earth elements uh, can be slightly different from what gets portrayed in the media, um, particularly recently. When, I, when I'm talking about rare earths, I'm talking about the lanthanide, so that's from lanthanum to lutetium, and I include yttrium in that as well, uh, because yttrium geochemically behaves identically to holmium, which is this, uh, uh, heavy rare earth at this end. Um, sometimes scanium gets included in this list, but scanium really isn't a rare earth. It, it doesn't associate with the rare earths in geological settings, and it also has very different uh, industrial applications than the rare earths. So there are essentially 15 elements here. There are 14 of the lanthanides. We don't include uh, pr um, promethium, which is in here because their, their natural abundance is infinitely low. 
Uh, there are no practical applications for that, um, but there are 15 with yttrium, and these elements have fairly unique uh, industrial properties. They, they have luminescent properties, they have magnetic properties um, that are, are very useful for modern technology in particular, and we'll get on to that. Uh, the history of rare earth mining is, is pretty interesting. Um, initially, after World War II, I guess, uh, demand for rare earths started to increase, and we were mostly um, getting our rare earths from a mine in California known as Mountain Pass, but it was fairly, um, it, it's well recognized that rare earths in geological situations are associated with these two elements, uranium and thorium, that everyone recognizes as being radioactive. Um, and so that becomes a problem for mining because then you have to do something with these uh, radioactive products as well. Uh, so when China, announced that they would uh, start producing rare earths in the 60s and 70s into the 80s. Um, US and other Western countries were quite happy for China to do that because they didn't have to deal with this issue of radioactivity or the um, fairly nasty chemical process that you need to, to process the ores. And that's pretty much the situation that remains even to today. This is still a very sensitive issue around rare earth mining is what you do with the radioactive elements. From my point of view as a research scientist, uh, the association with uranium thorium is a really good thing because uranium thorium are fantastic um, geochemical pathfinders or fingerprint tools for understanding the system. So having those two elements associated with the rare earth, plus we have neodymium which has uh, there is a, a samarium neodymium uh, radiogenic isotope system there. Um, we've got lots of geochemical tools to play with to directly understand how these ore systems work. All right, and I'll show you some examples of how we apply that to understanding, in particular the, the unconformity rare earth deposits today. This uh, diagram here comes from Geological Survey Sweden. This was uh, recently shown to me by Richard Lilly here at Adelaide. And I think this is a really nice diagram because it, it sort of uh, demonstrates the state of play of critical mineral mineral or critical raw materials, as they call it here, um, distribution inventory across uh, the globe. What we have is various different commodities here. This is the, um, the EU list uh, of critical minerals or critical commodities represented by the different colors and the pies uh, for each country represent the the proportion of that, uh, the size of the pie represents the proportion of those particular critical commodities that each country um, holds. So the Australian, uh, there is a, an Australian list of critical minerals, uh, it's slightly different, most of the elements you see here will be on that list as well, they're fairly universal, but by and large the, the rare earths, which we divide here into the heavy and light rare earths, uh, for good reasons, um, they are always towards the top of any of these critical minerals lists. And what's really obvious from this diagram straight away is the enormous inventory of critical minerals that lie in China. Uh, not just in terms of the size of the pie, but the, the number of pieces of pie there. You see they have a, a vast array of critical minerals. And this, with current geopolitical situation, um, with uh, trade, issues heating up between the US and now increasingly with Australia, this becomes um, somewhat of a uh, an issue, geo geopolitical issue, and is part of the reason why these are such critical minerals. So crit criticality is really defined on um, a risk, in, in part a risk of supply, and having a single country being the, the dominant supplier is certainly represents a geopolitical risk of supply. Um, you see our normal, um, let's say our Western friends, we usually consider our friends, the EU, the US, there are, the supply of critical minerals is not so uh, great there, and in Japan as well, whereas Australia we've got a, a number of commodities that are really important, that we're, that we're all familiar with, lithium in Western Australia, bauxite and coking coal, but you see the rare earths there as well, so we've got a good 12% of the inventory of both light and heavier earths. And I think that Australia has actually a lot more potential to increase that capacity. And so I think there's good potential that Australia can be a ongoing supplier for 
for rare earths in the future. But that really, that this diagram I think really nicely sort of uh, demonstrates the state of play and the critical why rare earths are so critical at the moment. All right, so why do we need rare earths? Um, rare earths are used in lots and lots of modern applications that we use every day, things like smartphones, laptops, uh, computers, etc. cetera. Um, they're used for in the screens, so the luminescent properties are used to, to, to make the colors on the screens. Those same luminescent properties are used in medical imaging, uh, which is the, the image shown on the, on the left. Um, and, they're used in neodymium and other rare earths are used in lasers. We use cerium for, for, for polishing glass and we use neodymium in magnets, the sort of thing we need for speakers, such as the headphones at the top. So lots of uh, rare earths are used in very small amounts, but in lots and lots of applications, uh, in lots of technological products like uh, computers, etc. So they're, they're becoming increasingly used across the planet. Um, but overall, the amount used in these products is relatively small. The two things at the bottom are a little bit of a game changer in the future for the future of rare earth supply. Um, the wind turbines, uh, each wind turbine there is, is, has um, a, a motor inside it, um, magnets that uh, in those electric motors, uh, neodymium magnets, high powered magnets, and the other one there, the car is a Tesla, so that's an electric vehicle. And these also require motors with electric motors with high powered magnets. So, so these things are really going to be a game changer for Eris in the future. So look, we'll just have a little bit of a look at that. Um, here's a, a, a bit of a outlook on energy use across the globe. Um, from now and for the next 40 years or so and the different sources of energy that we've got you can see that with the different colors you can see coal um, you know, nobody likes coal anymore so coal has lost favor and so coal being a dominant supplier of energy to the world will probably um, not be the case for very long but we're not seeing coal usage drop it's just going to level out gas will increase and certainly um, the federal government is, is now pushing gas as a major energy supplier in the near future. But the really big changes you see there are in orange is solar. That's going to really take over and be the dominant um, electric, electricity supplier in by 2035 and also wind and hydro. So renewable energy and the wind and hydro, they're, they're requiring turbines and each, uh, for example, a two megawatt wind turbine, they're, they're pretty typical turbine, the sort of ones you see on the shores of Lake George, for example, each of those contains about 400 kilograms of rare earths and um, that's mostly neodymium, which is a light rare earth, but there's also significant dysprosium in there, DY. Um, and dysprosium is needed to go with neodymium to make these magnets work at high temperature. Uh, and that's a lot. So when we look at the increase in uh, this renewable energy, the, the use of these turbines, and we're talking about 400 kilograms each, that it adds up to being a lot of um, demand per rare earth in the years ahead. Electric cars is, is a similar situation. Here we are, this is the uh, growth in passenger vehicles, electric car passenger vehicles up to 2040. We're down here at 2020 over here, very small little tower here, and we expect by 2040, according to these, statistics that about over 60 million passenger vehicles uh, sold per year will be electric uh, vehicles. All of them uh, currently with current technology would require motors with uh, neodymium magnets in them. Um, that's probably about 70% of global um, passenger vehicles on the road at that time and it's very much expected to be a similar situation for heavy heavy vehicles, things like trucks and buses is going to be the same. So that's a lot of uh, electric vehicles per year and each of those has about a kilo of rare earths. So we're talking about 65 million kilos of rare earths just required for that, um, for passenger vehicles by 2040. Um, of course, there's um, uh, a good reasons to say that we should be recycling rare earths. We use a lot of things like mobile phones that only last a few years and then um, get sent to recycling. There is a, a 
good case to be made that we should recycle the rare earths that we need, that we've already used for, to fu for future use, but there is no way that recycling can actually meet this demand because the amount of rare earths we've used in the last 20 years is nowhere near going to uh, account for the, the demand of rare earths in the next 20 years. We, we do need to be producing rare earths from uh, natural resources in the ground at the moment. So demand for rare earths is going to be big. We're, we're going to need it. Where do we get it from at the moment? This is uh, this little pie chart shows you the distribution of rare earth, global rare earth resources as a function of the geology of the deposits. Um, this is work from, from Weng et al. a few years ago, but it probably hasn't changed really. And you can see about half of the world's rare earths. And these are mostly light rare earths, neodymium, um, the dominant um, rare earth we need for for society uh, hosted in carbonatites. So carbonatites are alkaline, carbonate-rich magmas, fairly rare on the surface of the earth, um, but they are, they're, those particular magma types are very good at concentrating rare earths and uh, where we get roughly half our rare earths at the moment. But in reality, there's the two other large pieces of the pie there, the tailings and the laterite are also associated with carbonatites. So the tailings are mostly material that has previously be, been mined from carbonatite deposits. So we can really consider that as carbonatite. And the laterite is, um, to a large extent, are laterites that have developed, so weathering profiles that have developed over carbonatites. That's an example of uh, Mount Weld in Western Australia, which is, is the largest operating rare earth mine or rare earth producer outside of China at the moment, is a good example of that. And so really it's, it's something like 75% of all in the, in the ground or being mined comes from carbonatite. Uh, the geological setting of the, of the ore is, is carbonatite. And that's heavily, that's very much a light rare earth uh, rich system. The dark blue there is ISCGs, iron oxide, copper, gold, and that is mostly Olympic Dam. So Olympic Dam itself is the biggest um, by tonnage, the biggest res uh, resource of um, rare earths in the world, but it's fairly low grade, it's associated with uh, high uranium material and is not BHP is not currently looking at um, processing that material to extract rare earths. Uh, and then the last significant piece of the pie there is is the um, the yellow one, alkaline complexes and pegmatites. Pegmatites are a relatively minor component of that. Alkaline complexes refer to uh, uh, intrusions to a large extent uh, in places like Greenland in Canada. Um, where they have uh, both heavy rare earth element enrichment and light rare earth element enrichment. So even though they're only a relatively small part of the pie in terms of their value, because they, they contain a lot of the more valuable heavier rare earths, they're, they're much more useful here. Uh, and, you know, the big deposits are currently in Greenland, and that was partly behind the, the reason Donald Trump wanted to buy Greenland from Denmark was because of that. Um, resource of rare earths in Greenland. Uh, so, and, and then there are some minor um, little pieces of the pie here which are related to, to mineral sands. We have quite a lot of that in Australia and um, other sort of surface environments, but they're relatively minor. And when you break all that down, what we see in terms of geological setting, there's most of these, almost all of these deposits are related to magmas directly, like carbonatite to the alkaline complexes, or they're magma related, things like ICG, you can make a link to, to magmas in some sense. And almost all of these are light rare earth rich, so neodymium rich, which is good because we need a lot of neodymium. But uh, there is a bit of an issue here because the heavier rare earths are also vital, they're more critical than the light rare earths. Um, there are, there's less opportunities, less, less avenues for supply than the light rare earths. Um, but that's important to keep in mind that we're, we're looking at magmas here in, in some sense, unusual magmas, alkaline magmas that often associate with rare earth deposits. If you look at Australia now, so this was a, a bit of a compilation um, that are put out early in the year, and this is probably already out of date. Uh, this is looking at the major hard rock rare earth deposits in, in Australia, and I've broken them into four categories here. The carbonatites in blue, uh, SCARN and ICGs, even though those two geological settings are not necessarily uh, 
the same. They, they tend to form in the same terrains, namely in the Gawler, uh, you know, the Olympic Dam domain and the Mount Isa Inlier. And then we've got the peralkaline systems or alkaline systems, such as the Tungai deposit in, in uh, near Dubbo in New South Wales. Um, a little bit different from other global examples because our Australian examples tend to be volcanic associated rather than intrusive associated, but there are some important um, deposits there. And then there's one yellow dot there for Brown's Range, which is the unconformity setting, which I'll talk more about uh, later in the talk. So you can see they're set spread across the country. Some of these are active mines like Mount Weld and Browns Range is actually an active mine. Some of these are fairly advanced projects like Nolan Spore and Tungai and some of them are um, probably sub-economic prospects at the moment, but like Milo, Peaks Range in Queensland. Uh, there are more that have come on board since then. So in the Kernamona province, there are um, developing rare earth resources there amongst other places. So this, this is a rapidly changing situation. If we put where the focus for Exploring for the Future 2 is going to be, the two corridors, that's where they lie. And you can see a number of these deposits fall within those corridors, particularly the Browns Range um, deposits, which I'm going to talk more about um, down the track. So that's um, good that there is these deposits sit in those corridors. All right, so if we think about economic geology. It's a fairly mature science in a lot of ways. Um, and you may think, well, we know rare earth deposits associated with alkaline magmas. We can just go and find the alkaline magmas and then we've got an ore deposit. It doesn't work that easily. It never works that easily with ore deposits. But I think rare earths, are, there is a extra problems here because the um, history of exploration of study of rare earth deposits is very young. And I'll put this up here. This is a a series of books by um, Agricola from uh, 500 years ago. This was really a documentation of the state of the mining industry and the exploration industry in Europe uh, in you know 500 years ago. And if you're interested in mining history, this is really interesting to read um, in the context of the modern mining industry because a lot of the issues uh, were that we currently have today with the mining industry were around 500 years ago. So there are chapters in the book about where you go to find mineral deposits here. Mostly they're, they're interested in tin and copper and silver surface deposits. So the first panels there show some mineralized veins cropping out and uh, the books describe how you go about looking for these, how you recognize them in the field, how you determine whether it's uh, viable to mine or not. Uh, there was chapters in the book about how you set up a mine, how you um, sh uh, dig shafts, the sort of uh, equipment that you need. Uh, and uh, there are aspects about silicosis in there, even though silicosis wasn't recognised as, as a disease then. It was recognised that you could uh, get very sick from working in these environments. Um, you can see the, the trees cut down there in the, the middle panel. There was discussion about the... Um, environmental destruction associated with mining, which is really not that different to sort of issues that we we uh, hear about today. And then lastly, there's, there's a lot of uh, focus on what you do with the ores afterwards, how you smelt them, how you extract the metals. So the point here really is that we've been using base metals and precious metals really for thousands of years and the technology, the knowledge on how we go about finding them and extracting them is it's not particularly new. Obviously, we're, ref we're refining that um, with new technology and new knowledge, but uh, we've got a very long history of understanding these things. And metals like rare earth is not really the case. They've only become important commodities for industry since after World War II, and really the first publications on rare earth ore deposits only appeared in the literature in the 60s, late 60s to 70s. So we're a long way behind in terms of understanding how these ore system works and how we can explore for them. But luckily we can we can lever off this knowledge from other ore systems plus knowledge from geology in general uh, and we're making uh, good progress I think on understanding these systems and coming up with ideas that will, will inform on exploration in the future. One thing that I've done recently is look at um, 
ore deposits over time. So given that there are opportunities to date rare earth ore deposits effectively, we, we can um, start to collate the age of deposits through time and see that how that sits with geological events throughout Earth history. And there is some infamy, interesting information that comes out of this. So um, here all I've done is assigned a, a value of one for each ore deposit. I haven't looked at the size of the deposit or the, or the value of the deposit. In particular, just a, an ore deposit, recognised ore deposit, gets a value of one and then plotted them on histogram over the um, time going back to 2.8 billion years ago. Before that, in, t in the Archean, we don't really see rare earth deposits forming. Um, so at the top, we've got the Australian deposits, and we can see there's a big peak in the middle there between about 2 and 1 billion years ago. And at the bottom, we've got the global a global compilation of deposits, and we see also there is a peak um, a uh, cluster of deposits that are formed between one and two billion years ago, and then we have a very big peak at much younger ages, younger than about 500 million years ago. And this has to be taken in the context of the, the age distribution of the surface, what's currently exposed on continents, and that's represented by the, cr the green dashed curve there. Um, that's a cumulative trend going from oldest to youngest up to 100%. So that's the scale on the on the right hand side. And what we see the big peak, big series of peaks we see younger than about 500 million years is probably to be expected because if we look at the surface age distribution, we see about half of the current exposure of the continental crust is also younger than 500 million years. So we would expect a bias towards deposits of that age as well, uh, simply just because that's what's available on the planet. If we look at the, the peak, you know, the series of peaks between two and one billion years ago, um, that represents about 30% of the world's deposits and includes many of the biggest ones. So I've listed two there. Mountain Pass was that original mine in California. And Bayanobo is now, it is by far a giant, super giant ore deposit. Uh, it's where we currently get most of the world's rare earth from and have for the last 20 or 30 years or so. So the big deposits also sit in that. Um, time frames that we plotted um, tonnages of rare earths that the peak in that Proterozoic era would be much bigger. Whereas if you look at the, the slope of the green curve across that period, there's only something like 10, 5 to 10 percent of the uh, exposed continental crust that formed during that time. So this is this big peak here is not a function of, of the amount of Crust that, the continental crust that is exposed, there is a, a bias towards this period. We do see a lot more deposits forming in this time period. Um, so what was going on then? So if we plotted gold deposits, um, they wouldn't form in this period. We've plotted nickel deposits, they don't form in this period either. And so this period sort of in the grey there has been labelled boring, the boring billion by some people. It's also a time where um, climate on Earth was not doing much, there was very little climate change, and it was relatively stable tectonics. We didn't see, we, we saw a transition from Nuna to Rodinia at this time, but that was only kind of a partial breakup rather than a full supercontinental breakup. So in general, tectonics were fairly inactive across this time as well. Uh, and so Initially, that might be seen as a strange reason why there are ore deposits there, but I think it's actually a really, there is some sense for why there is. I think active tectonics tends to um, destroy rare earth ore deposits or it they provides the conditions where they don't tend to form. So this fairly inactive tectonics is a good um, yeah, uh, good situation for, for preserve, producing and preserving rare earth ore deposits. And I'll show you an example with the unconformity stuff uh, shortly. All right, so we better move on. So um, that's a little bit of background in rare earths uh, in the Australian context. And now I really want to talk about the unconformity system because I think this is kind of exciting. It's a new area um, that we're getting into and has a lot of potential. So we're talking about Brown's range up here. So I'm going to zoom in on that in a bit more detail. It's the, the yellow dot there. Um, so on the top panel here, we're zooming in on the, to northern northern Australia, northern central Australia. You can see the Western Australian Northern Territory border running up through here. Um, so this is the work, uh, Timor's work. There's a series of papers out on this now in the last few years documenting a lot of this stuff. Um, 
and the Browns Range mineralization sits on the edge of the Browns Range Dome, which goes across the border. And all this, these red stars here represent um, very similar styles of mineralization that are spread over this area. So it's been recognized in the Horse Creek origin at John Galt, some 200 kilometers to the north or more, and further south into the Tanami as well. So it really is a, a regional mineralization style, and um, more examples of this mineralization are being discovered all the time in this area. If we zoom a bit more, zoom in a bit more onto the, this uh, area here where the Browns Range Dome is, that's this uh, pink thing here. And currently Northern Minerals where they're working is in the Western Australian portion of the dome in here, the blob, the blob in figure C. So if we go to that, I'll run through quickly the geology that we see. So we can see the stars there. There's, there's examples of mineralization all through this area in this blue unit. Um, currently the, the biggest deposit is this one up in the north known as Wolverine. So each of these deposits and prospects has a name and they're all named after X-Men characters. Uh, Wolverine is, um, has been mined. So just pre-COVID, pre Northern Minerals were, had a, uh, a mining operation there. They had a small plant set up and they were producing heavier rare earth concentrates. They shut down because of COVID because essentially the Kimberley shut down and I think they're probably close to or have restarted their operations now. So this is the only heavy rare earth producer in the world outside of China at the moment. It's relatively small volumes, but still. But you can see the mineralization is spread all through this blue unit. This blue unit here, which is BRM, is known as the Browns Range Metamorphics. These are uh, fairly immature sandstones to arcos, uh, some conglomerates um, that have seen fairly low grade metamorphism, and that's the major host for the mineralization here. Um, in what do we got? In pink, off to the east, we have the Browns Range Dome granite. That's a, a late Archean granite. And then there's some mafic, ultramafic bodies in green that have been really uh, defined from geophysics. But they they have seen metamorphism, so they they predate say 1700 million years. The Browns Range metamorphics. Um, so Timor's done some work on that. It's quite interesting that detrital zircons uh, in that material, um, the, the petrology of those sediments indicates it has a very proximal source, uh, not, not much of a, a diverse source, a very um, maybe a single source, and those zircons come out at 3.1 to 3.2 uh, GA, which makes it amongst the oldest material in Central Australia. So there is some sort of very relatively old Archean basement uh, feeding into these sediments, which is uh, of interest. You can see the deposits are forming on faults largely, and over to the west there's this thick um, thick line here which represents a, a regional unconformity between that basement brown range metamorphics and uh, the Gardner sandstone of the Birundudu group, um, which is relatively unmetamorphosed uh, through here. And that unconformity surface dips gently to the west. And so if we were to reconstruct that uh, um, without erosion, you'd see a lot of these deposits actually form very close to that unconformity. And in, in the south here, you see some of them really fall right on that unconformity. So that's an important observation. Um, what the ore looks like, uh, they, they sit in these fault structures or on the, on the unconformity within the arcos, within the sandstones. Um, this, the core of these things, the larger systems are fairly chaotic breaches where we have highly altered class of the of the host rock and um, a matrix largely made out of xenotime. So these pictures here, the bottom picture here, all of the pink stuff here is xenotime with a little bit of hematite staining. So very high uh, xenotime content. And xenotime is a heavier rare earth phosphate. The formula is up the top there. The only other ore mineral we see in here is the mineral fluorensite, which contains the light rare earth, but that's relatively minor. This ore is very, very heavy earth rich, which is why it's so valuable. It's, it's really um, the heavier earths that are very much in high demand, and this is an important source of them. So as we move out of these major fault structures, we get into more uh, mosaic breaches, crackle breaches like this top panel here. We see altered class of the host rock and these veins, crackle veins coming in with xenotime in pink and quartz in that sort of gray color here. So that's what the ore looks like. It's very clearly hydrothermal in origin. Um, and there's no obvious link to magnetism in this case. 
Um, dating xenotime is a very nice mineral to date. You can use uranium lead dating on it. And Timor's done a lot of this. This is a, this diagram with age across the top there and various different samples from various different um, deposits and prospects listed down the side. The colors represent different textual settings of the, of the xenotime. Um, that's not so important. Well, it's important for the study, but for today, the main point I really want to get across is that the bulk of the mineralization, which is the red and green, uh, red, sorry, red and blue data, are sitting between about 1.62 to 1.64, 1.65 GA. Uh, and that's much later than the regional metamorphism. So uh, muscovite that's associated with these rocks, um, argon-argon dating of that comes in about 16, 1750, so significantly older, and other work in the area shows that metamorphism is earlier. Uh, at the bottom in, in um, yellow here are some other geochronological dates for the mineralization in the area, and you can see they come up um, with similar ages. So 1.6, 1.65 is the age of, mineraliz of mineralization, and that's kind of a bit um, confusing because if you look at the uh, tectonic setting, the reconstruction back to that time, we, we think the North Australian Craton was assembled, largely assembled at that time, but there wasn't much going on where Brown's Range sits. So what we did have is the, the Liebig orogeny to the south of the North Australian Craton, so we had to uh, a collision of a terrain there, metamorphism, some magmatism um, in that area in the southern Arunta. And around that time or slightly later, we had the, um, the Eisen orogeny kicking off, but that's also well to the east of where Brown's Range is. So there are events more distally, but nothing really going on around Brown's Range. There are no um, magmas that we know of in the area. We've dated some granites and pegmatites. They all come out much older than the mineralization. Uh, so whatever is driving this mineralization, we don't think it's related to magmas. There's no evidence of that. And we're not sure how it relates to, uh, certainly to orogenesis. If it does, it's, it's very distally related. So no magmatism, no local tectonics related to mineralization. Um, so how do we make this style of, of ore deposits? If you look at globally, there are pretty much no other deposits like it, and, or there's one other, which we'll mention later, um, and certainly almost none that aren't related to magmas in some form. Um, we can get some hints on this by looking at geochemistry and other geological information. So the first plot here is just a rare earth plot. We've, we've listed the lanthanides going from lanthanum to lutetium. Um, these are fairly common plots that people put up, um, putting our samples normalized to chondrite just to make it easier to, to visualize. At the top in gray, we have um, ore samples. That's the, the rare earth pattern of the xenotime rich ore. You can see very rich in the heavier rare earths and a prominent negative Euro europium anomaly just here. The host sandstones, the arcos, which is BRM, these are the blue lines we can see here. They are, they're pretty typical of, of continental clastic sediments in general. But where these arrows are here, we see a depletion in the, the sort of middle to middle rare earths, middle to heavy rare earths, which isn't easily explained by sedimentary processes or metamorphic processes or anything else. That This is kind of a very unusual pattern. And what we think is that we're seeing some sort of leaching of the rare earths out of these sediments and uh, that's the rare earths that are being transported into these fault zones and precipitating to form ore. And so uh, the fact that we also see the European anomaly, typical of continental sediments, uh, reflected in the ore is also an indication that that signature is being transported from the host sediments. The other plot there is just showing you more detail um, to uh, rare earth ratios to show that the, the sediments here, they, the undepleted ones, look similar to Archean granites. That's what we think the source of these sediments were. But the depletion trend uh, plots off in a very different direction from the granites. But what it does do is plot in the exact opposite direction where the ore sits, again indicating um, there is a genetic link here. But really what um, I guess nails this is isotopes. As I said, mentioned earlier, that neodymium isotopes are very useful traces. We can measure the ore itself because neodymium is an ore element um, and look at how that, what that tells us about the source of the rare earths. To put this simply, um, 
you, we don't need to know very much about uh, radiogenic isotope systems here. All we're doing is looking at comparing potential sources to the ore to figure out where the rares come from. So this is epsilon neodymium calculated to the age of ore, so 16, 1650-ish. Um, if we had mantle-derived igneous rocks in the area, which is um, where we get most alkaline rocks that host other rare earth deposits, they would plot up here in this grey field. And the ore from Brown's Range, which are these coloured um, coloured uh, bars at the bottom, these are various um, either in, in situ um, measurements on the ore minerals or bulk rock samples, which are the red ones, they plot very different from that. So again, it's indicating no magnetism involved. They're very negative values, um, so they're, they're consistent with having a fairly old evolved source. And the Browns range metamorphics, which are the, the brown ones here, match that perfectly. So this really is confirming that the rare earths for mineralization are being stripped directly out of those uh, sediments in the basement there. All right. Um, how are we going? I better get moving. Um, Okay, so we get them out there. How do we move them? Rare earths are notoriously notorious for being fairly immobile in hydrothermal fluids. Um, but one way experimental work showed that you could do it if you have saline fluids. If salty fluids, they're better at moving rare earths. We have evidence that the fluids that move these rare earths are salty. So if you look at uh, micas that are associated with the ore, this is uh, a backscatter electron image here of micas the ones i really want to focus on i guess are the, the sin ore ones here and in particular the second diagram panel c where we see fluorine and chlorine contents in the micas and they're significantly elevated compared to background micas so it indicates that the the um, muscovite that grew with the ore from the same fluids as the ore minerals was uh, halogen bearing but probably the best constraints we have come from fluid inclusion so these Quartz associated with the mineralization here often contains these little bubbles, these little pockets of the hydrothermal fluid. They got trapped when the quartz grew. Here's an example here. They're very tiny, so 10 to 20 microns, but we can uh, measure them on heating freezing stage to try and understand their composition. And we can all also analyze their elemental composition using the laser. Um, and a lot of Timor's work, very painstaking work, on these inclusions show that indeed there are multiple fluid types. He's got uh, type one, type two, type three. Um, the details don't matter too much, except that the type ones, uh, which we also see in barren veins, so quartz that not, is not associated with mineralization, is very water rich on this diagram up here. They plot up near the water corner, whereas other types of fluid inclusion in these veins have significant salt contents, either NaCl or calcium chloride. So salty fluids are involved here. And um, I think I'll, just for the sake of time, I'll skip over that. That's, this is really just to show that we see alteration going on as well. So we're converting feldspars to muscovite, um, which indicates that we've had relatively high fluid flux through these fault um, systems. Um, but to go back to the rare earths, if we, we look at um, their composition in a bit more detail, we see the bottom plot here. These are plotting individual measurements on rare earths. The TM is the, the freezing point depression, if you like. This is a measure of the salinity of the inclusions. So more negative man numbers mean more saline. And essentially, we have sort of two major populations there, ones uh, that are uh, very low salinity, close to zero. So these are water-rich fluids, uh, including the barren veins that only have these, which are in green. And then we have in red these type three inclusions that are very salty, so very um, depressed melting points down here and uh, a mixture of things in between. So what we, uh, our model for how this works is that we have rare earth bearing fluids um, being carried in salty fluids from the basement coming out of the Brown's range metamorphics. We have water rich fluids from um, another source that carry phosphorus and it's important to keep the phosphorus and the rare earth separate in fluids because when you put rare earths and phosphate together, they become very, very insoluble. It's very, very difficult to come up with a scenario where you can transport those components together in a single fluid. If you bring them together, uh, they can dump out as rare earth phosphate minerals. So that's our um, what we our model for how we think this deposit forms. 
Um, we mix between these two fluids uh, in these fault structures or, or near the unconformity, and that's how we get deposition of rarest phosphates. And that's sort of shown here in this cartoon. Um, so we're here we have our Browns Range metamorphics underneath, old basement, the unconformity surface running through here with the younger Birundudu sandstones on top. We have low pH phosphate bearing fluids coming down and we have rare earth bearing fluids, uh, saline fluids coming up and where they meet, we precipitate uh, xenotime um, plus quartz to make mineralization. We also convert uh, felspars to muscovite according to this reaction here. So the, the, the alteration assemblage supports this, the mineralization supports this. So that's our working model for how this forms. Um, we've seen this distributed in, uh, in Northern Australia, but there are other examples. There is one other example, at least, that we've found in the Athabasca Basin in Canada. So this is uh, also an unconformity, is a famous unconformity uranium uh, field. And there's this thing called a Moore zone, which is, is almost identical, well, not almost identical, it's very similar in terms of its mineralization style and geological setting forming. A breccia zone with xenotime quartz close to this regional unconformity, which is in an area where we also see uranium, unconformity uranium deposits. Uh, so finally, just to finish up here, I'm a bit over time, um, is there uh, potential for more of this mineralization style in Australia? I think there is huge potential. We're looking at a basin hosted system. We don't need to focus on some fairly unusual alkaline rocks that we would, would for other rare earth deposits. And so I think there are a lot of areas of the Australian continent where we potentially could find more of this mineralization style, particularly Pine Creek, where we already have unconformity uranium deposits. Um, we're looking at the moment at around in the Georgina Basin around the Mount Isa in Lyre. We have a projects with the GSQ on that. And I think there are uh, potential in other places in Northern Territory, even into South Australia as well. Uh, and that, that will be one of the focus of our new project will be to, to further understand this mineralization system and try and develop uh, ways that we can go about exploring for them or at least um, identifying other geological settings where this mineralization style might exist. All right, I think that's the end of my talk. All right, thanks. Well, thank you, Carl. That was uh, the, that was a fascinating overview, and uh, it's great. I, I learned a lot about the unconformity-related systems. Uh, we do have quite a few questions that have come through. So the first one, Charles McGee. Uh, Carl, do you know the sulfate content of the Florence oh, site? Hi, Chuck. How are you going? Um, yes, we do. Um, they are variable. So there, there are multiple generations of genotime. There are multiple generations of Florencite. Uh, and Timor has pretty much picked that apart. Um, there is a, if you're really interested, there is a paper in, thinking it's in mineralogy and petrology, maybe last year, where he documents all of the florensite compositions there. They tend to be um, the light rare earth rich end member, but there are some variations into the, the strontium um, uh, sulfate end member as well. So there is a bit of variation there. But I can send you that paper if you're interested, Chuck. Great, thanks. Um, next question from John Menzies. Uh, would expect to see some significant enrichment in uranium. Do you see that? Yes. Um, so these deposits were originally discovered because the company was Northern Uranium. They were looking for uranium. Um, so they do appear as radiometric highs um, in radiometric Im images. And when they found them, they're, they're, they are elevated in uranium, but not anywhere near all grade. Um, but I think it's there's a fundamentally different precipitation process. Even though the geological setting is very similar, probably uh, movement sort of fluid compositions may be similar to unconformity uranium settings, but I think we don't need a redox uh, redox precipitation mechanism here. We, we've got fluid mixing as the mechanism. So rare earths aren't directly influenced by redox changes. They may be indirectly. Um, so I, while there is elevated uranium here, and that's probably associated with these, with the movement of the rare earths, it, they're nowhere near um, all grades, although some of the deposits are higher in uranium than others. 
And the other thing I'll say is unconformed uranium deposits do usually have elevated rare earth contents, anomalous rare earth contents. They often see fluorensite and these uh, sort of minerals associated with unconformed uranium systems. So I don't think they're, they're certainly not mutually exclusive of each other. There is sort of a uh, sort of grey band in between where they're, they're, they're certainly related to each other in some sense. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for that. I, Leslie Wyborn adds that uh, Brown's Rage was a thorium uh, anomaly and that it has uh, very similar, um, I suppose, elements to Coronation Hill, which uh, AXA did work on in the 1990s. But moving on to the next question uh, is from Alison. Uh, do you think the rare earth element slash phosphate association is what has happened in the Georgina Basin phosphorites as well? Uh, I think the, the Georgina Basin, so we've just got a new project. So the GSQ have been working on Georgina Basin and we've got a new project starting on that. Um, I think, yes, I think the there is anomalous rare earth contents in some of the, particularly close to the unconformity with the, with the Mount Isa and I, there is anomalous rare earth contents that's starting to be recognised, the work that um, the GSQ have been doing. Um, I think it's a little bit uns we're a little unsure of what that means at the moment, whether that's sedimentary related, whether that's related to weathering or whether it's hydrothermal. Um, almost certainly it's related to weathering in some cases, um, but yeah, there definitely is a direct association between rare earths and phosphate in those, in those settings, yeah. Thanks. Um, the next one is from Christopher Yule. Uh, do radiometric maps show any indication of rare element distribution or are the deposits too deep? Oh, hi Chris. Um, no, so these deposits are outcropping. So that even that image there you see, they're, they're, um, is at the ridge behind there. We're very close to there, there is an outcrop of the ore. So that pink, very pink rock that I showed a picture of is actually outcropping material. So all of the almost all of the deposits here have been recognised from outcrops of xenotime quartz breaches at the surface that, that form uh, little erosional um, mounds or ridges. And I think in this case, it is a really important because they're probably uneconomical if you have to, if they're buried too deeply. You, I mean, you wouldn't, it'd be difficult to find them and um, the, the economics would probably not be there. And in fact, that's, pretty true for most rare earth deposits in, in the country. They're, most of them are exposed at the surface. Thanks, Carl. Um, Evgeny Bastrikov asks, uh, can you comment on sources of phosphorus? Uh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. Uh, we don't know. Um, so the, the garden of sandstone itself that we're sort of assuming the phosphate comes from is not particularly phosphate rich. Um, there is some reports of some phosphate, maybe some minor phosphate units in there, but it's it's not obvious at all that, that um, phosphate is coming from there. It's something that we're going to look into um, in, the, in the new project coming up is where the phosphate comes from and how you move it. Um, so that's probably, I would say, is the the biggest, most speculative part of our model is where the phosphate comes from because we really don't have any real control. It's just assumed that it comes from from above or from somewhere else, but we don't know, to be honest. Thanks, Carl. Um, we've got lots of positive comments uh, here. Uh, Charles and McGee adds, but the phos phosphate there was clearly stratiform with the sedimentary phosphorite, uh, and that was in Georgina. Georgina. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it, it certainly is uh, I think there's going to be a sedimentary story there for sure as well. Yeah, um, yeah. but so, maybe in a couple of years we'll I'll be able, we'll be able to um, inform you more about that one. It's very interesting to see how that will go. Yeah, I think the US linked it to variations in ocean chemistry and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, there are lots of positive comments uh, about the talk, so thank you very much. Um, I've got a question. Um, you, you finished up by identifying a few areas which, uh, you know, that there's lots of potential across um, Australia for this. What, are, what criteria would you suggest um, one could use to screen frontier regions for this type of mineralisation? 
that's a really good question. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I think the Georgina Basin originally was screened because we had phosphate-rich sediments overlying an old uh, prozoic basement terrain that potentially um, was quite rare earth rich and potentially had um, meta-evaporites in it. So the, the Corella formation, for example, um, full of scapolite and potentially you could generate salty fluids to move those rare earths up into the overlying sequences. So I think you'd probably want to look obviously at structures where we have these structural pathways, but sources of rare earths. So you'd want some way of moving rare earths with some sort of salt source to provide the, the hydrothermal salty fluids. Um, and then you'd also want to look at where you get phosphate from. Now that uh, answering the question earlier, that isn't obvious at Brown's Range where the phosphate comes from, but I think once we start, so I think the Georgina Basin will be interesting because that's really phosphate rich. Um, whether we get the minerals, you know, if the anomalous rare earths there are just sedimentary or weathering related, or if, if there is some component of hydrothermal activity that's generated something that some sort of mineralization that'll be really interesting to look at. I, um, but I don't really know, to be honest. I think that's something we're really going to focus on in the next two years to try and refine that a bit better. Yeah, well, we, we look forward to working on that. And there's just time for one last question. Are the deposit uh, from Steve Micklethwaite, are the deposits towards the margins of the basin? Um, no, well, I don't know. So the Browns Range metamorphics, that arcos, there's very little outcrop that we don't really know much about the sedimentology of that at all. And that's what hosts most of the, the mineralization. Um, that's it's a very proximal source so what we sort of suspect is that was a very probably a fairly small basin uh, maybe a intercontinental rift or something like that um, but i don't think we're anywhere near really understanding that package of rocks at all at the moment to know where it sits in a, in a broader basin setting well uh thank you very much carl uh it uh i the, the talk was uh, was excellent. Uh, I think we all learned uh, a lot from it. Um, and I just want to point out to people online that next week we'll be welcoming back David Heselhurst, Deputy Secretary of the Agriculture Trade Group, Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment for his seminar, More Agile Minds and an Encore and Expansion of the Benefits of the Agile Mindset in the Workplace. Um, the timing for that is a little bit different than standard. It'll be between 3.30 and 4.30 uh, p.m. Uh, so you'll need to register on the link that has just gone into the chat right now. Uh, so once again, thank you very much, Carl. And uh, we hope to, um, we look forward to our collaborations in the future. All right, thanks. Thanks. All right. <laughs>